Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night watch party. We are so glad that you're tuning in from home, from work, wherever you're tuning in from tonight. We got some great and amazing things happening here at the Wayward Outreach. As you just saw, marriage challenge is coming up. It's right around the corner, and we are so excited about it. But here's the thing. As you heard, there's actually going to be limited packets that we're sending out. And there's already been over 600 of those packets that have been claimed. They're going to get a book, a workbook, and it's going to teach us all kinds of things. There's going to be homework in there. And it's really not just like a four-week thing. It's not four Sundays. It's a 30-day challenge. We're going to go home with resources and tools. And this isn't just for married couples. You know, I took maybe three marriage challenges before I got married, which was last October. And my wife and I, we talk about it. Well, how come maybe we're not facing some of that tension that some people face, you know, during their early years? And she says, well, it's because we've been through three marriage challenges. We've been prepared. So singles, sign up. Register for your packet today. Go on the app. Make sure you claim your packet and reserve it because they're going fast. There's only about 300 or so left. So you want to make sure you reserve yours today. But not only that. You know, um, any, any place, you know this, any place that you invest, you, you, that's where you get a return. And in relationships, if... Like, where do we learn how to do relationships? Really, school teaches us how to do math, you know, science, sociology, different things like that, history. But they don't teach us how to do relationships. And that's the biggest thing in life. And if we're going to, we have to learn how to love, learn how to forgive, learn how to treat people. We have to learn about the opposite sex, men, women, how they act, what, what. If we don't learn this kind of stuff, we run into all kinds of problems. So we spend every year 30 days focusing on building relationship skill. Get good at relationships. And if you get good at relationships, this is what's going to happen. You'll be great at life. So um, marriages are, you know, that's a big deal because we're raising either godly children or ungodly children. And we know this, if we're not getting along and we're fighting and we can't get it together in our relationships, it really tells our kids, God must not be real. He can't even get you guys to get along. So it's a really big, bigger thing than we could ever imagine. There's fights for our families and warfare over households. And what we're going to do, you sign up, and you can sign up online tonight, but also sign up your friends. Everyone, sign up one. I'll say it again. Everyone... Sign up one. And this is what you want to do. Now, what happens if we run out of packets? At that point, we'll, we're going to research and do everything we can to see if we can find some more packets. But right now, to guarantee you get a packet so you get the full experience, sign up tonight. And, and once you're signed up, we're going to save a packet for you. All right? So also, we got Easter coming up. Easter. Last year, I don't even know. I didn't check on this. But I'm thinking this. This was the first Easter that's ever been canceled, right. ever. Right. And the churches were closed, and it was canceled. Right. Last Easter, we're going to have to now, this is what we're believing, Easter is the biggest harvest day of the year. Right. This is an opportunity for us to bring our friends and relatives to hear the good news, bring people to Jesus so they can hear the good news and be saved for eternity. We don't want to let this that day just pass us by. Right. So let's be intentional about this day. Let's make up for last year. And let's, this is what we want. We want this to be the biggest Easter we've ever had. We want to bring a soul to the Lord. This is what we want to do. Come to Easter services. We have Good Friday service. Then we have a sunrise service at 6 o'clock in the morning. Amazing service. Then we have our 9 and 11 service. Make it, make it a goal. I'm going to show up. And I'm going to really worship God that whole week. That whole week, I'm dedicated to magnifying and worshiping God. And I'm also going to do this. I'm going to bring somebody. So let's sign up somebody, and then let's bring somebody. So let's be intentional about that. This is what I'm doing. Every day, I'm setting a goal to invite just one person. So we've got 25 days left. I'm going to invite 25 people in 25 days. And I'm gonna, my goal is to sign up five people or five couples to the marriage challenge. But if we just all do one, that'd be cool. Amen. That'd 
That's awesome. But not only that, we're we're reopening our Wednesday night oh, service. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's true, too. That's coming up soon. So right now, we have watch parties all over at home. But we're going to be relaunching and reopening our Wednesday night service. There's, there's yeah. an announcement that came out yeah. not too long ago. Yeah. That on April 1st, all theme parks are going to be able to open up. Yeah. That means Disneyland, Disneyland's Magic Mountain, all these places. The so if these places, Movie theaters. Movie theaters are opening up. Restaurants. Restaurants are opening up. Yeah. If all these places are open up, it's time that we open up the church doors on a yeah. Wednesday night. Yeah, and don't do this. All of a sudden, you you show up at Disneyland and not here. Well. That messed up. <laughs> On Easter weekend. <laughs> so, so let's make sure we do that. Um, so we're, we're getting ready. On Wednesday nights, Wednesday night revival. Yes. Re Wednesday night revival. We got, basically on Wednesday night, some of the top speakers in the world lined up week after week after week after week. They're coming in from all over the United States, coming here on Wednesday nights. It's going to be like Friday night fire. It's going to be Wednesday night revival. You do not want to miss it. It's going to be packed out. We're going to be worshiping God. So you got to get ready for that too. Right. That's all happening within that week. That's and right. we're remodeling right now or we're building our cafe restaurant. We're, we're Hopefully we could get that open by Easter as well. So, it's, so we got a lot of stuff going on. It's going to be good. And that date for Wednesday is April 7th is April the day 7th. we're opening up. So Wednesday night Wednesday revival. Wednesday night revival. Let's get ready for Wednesday that. Wednesday night revival. All right. No, good. <laughs> All right. So a lot of stuff's going on, and we just kind of need you to be informed of what's going on, and then we have to take some action. Let's get some people. Write down 10 names. Um, follow up on them like their eternal life depends on it because it does. Let's do that, all right? So let's pray. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for all the great things you're doing and setting up so our friends and family members can get saved. So we pray, Father, that we would, Lord, just take heed to the instructions you've given us. But Lord, tonight, Lord, you're going to speak to us a message, Lord, that will transform lives, God. Lord, I, Lord you, you gave me a little teaser earlier today about what we're going to cover tonight. And God, I can't wait, Father, to hear from you, for all of us to hear from you, Lord, about how to be happy. Speak to us tonight and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say amen and amen. Well, Pastor Marco, you got, you got a chance to share with me a little bit in the back about what we're going to cover. Church, let me tell you, this is a great message tonight. And we've been covering about how to be happy. And a question we have a lot today is, how come I'm not happy? Why am I not happy in life? Why, why am I just, I, I'm weary, I'm tired, I'm stressed out, I'm anxious, I'm angry. Well, we're learning through scripture, well, this is probably why we're not happy. And we covered some of that last week and the week before. So tonight we're in part three on how to be happy. But first we're gonna talk about what Jesus says. This is his first sermon and what he talks about happiness. So why don't we talk about that, some foundational truths about happiness. We're going to review two foundational truths that are really important that we, we set the foundation of what we're learning today. And when we're talking about happiness, we're not talking about a giddy happiness like, ah! <laughs> but we're, what we're talking about is a, a sense of well-being within you, peace and contentment. This stuff is deep. Yeah. And you could only get this type of happiness. This type of happiness is a Greek word named, uh, it's, it's pronounced makarios. It means a supremely Bless life. Wow. And this kind of deep happiness you can't find in anything or anyone but Jesus Christ. Right. You were created to live with this sense of well-being and calmness and peace within and contentment within your soul. Jesus displays this kind of happiness or contentment or depth of well-being when he's in a storm. He's in a storm and the disciples are in the same storm. The only difference was the only difference was Jesus had Macarius in him. The disciples didn't have that, so they were dependent on the outside. What was going on was determining what was going to happen on the inside. And this is why so many of us are moody. We go up and down because as the circumstances go up and down, our mood swing goes up and down. And when you go to a therapist, they tell you, you're bipolar. <laughs> and what it is, is you're missing something. They might diagnose it as bipolar, but this is what I know. Without the Lord, you don't have a sense of well-being or a calmness in your soul. Now, when you don't have a calmness in your soul, it makes you dangerous. Wow. 
And the reason it makes you dangerous, because you're in search for your happiness. You're, in, you're searching for your contentment. You're on the hunt. And this is what happens when you're on the hunt. You use people wow. to, to feed your, your emptiness. Wow. You'll go to things that are self-destructive for temporary happiness. And this is what happens. And it creates long-term misery and long-term destruction. It's not a fair trade. So God is saying, I know all of you are looking for the sense of well-being. And I'm going to show you how to get it. I'm going to show you how to, what the mindset is. I'm going to show you how I think. And if you start thinking like me, you could start getting these results. I'm going to show you how, what are the steps to living this life of contentment. Now, we know that Jesus wants us to be happy. Right. Well, how do we know Jesus wants, to be, wants us to be happy? With the foundational truth, number one, Jesus wants us to be happy. So this way that he taught us how to be happy. Right. So his first lesson was a teaching on this subject of happiness. Now, I want you to get this. This is not an emotional sermon. Right. This, is, this, is a, this is what it's going to lead you to is a mature Christian walk. Wow. When you're mature, you're not up and down on all your emotions and your moods. We need to get to the point that we're not, that we're not like experiencing happiness. We are happy. Right. Is part of who we are. So let's look at um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. Let's just read it, and we're going to see a, a, a subject. Happy, 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 or word he keeps using. Look at it. Take a look at this. Verse 1, it says, Jesus saw the crowds and went up on a hill where he sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. This is what he taught. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. The kingdom of, God belong, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn, God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble, they will receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires, God will satisfy them fully. Happy are those who are merciful to others, God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart, they will see God. Happy are those who work for peace, God will call them his children. And happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Wow. So there, for sure we know, like if, if there was a title to the sermon, it would just be happy. Because he says the word over and over and over. And I, I think we need to know this. God wants you to have a, he just doesn't want you to have eternal life which means uh, forever life, or it means a quantity of life. He also wants you to have a quality of life, right. a sense of well-being. Now, I'm, he's not saying everything's going to be perfect. What he's saying, when things aren't perfect, you could still be calm. When things aren't going right, you could still have some peace because your peace doesn't come from the outside. Your peace comes from your relationship right. on the inside. Right. Does anybody want that kind of happiness, peace, contentment, or calmness in their soul? Yes. Of course we do. So Jesus taught about happiness, and, and he goes, happy, are they, happy is this person, happy is this person. And let's go to truth number two, and then we're going to go into the attitudes and mindsets, and we're going to cover one more mindset today that leads to a happy life. But truth number two. The second truth is we will never be truly happy doing our own way. Yeah, doing it our way, yeah, that's right. So that, that basically, but it's very easy. It's a yeah. simple formula. I do it my way, I don't receive the happiness of God. I do it his way, I receive his happiness and his joy in my life. You know what I love about this is that we will, we will never be happy doing it our way. So some of us are not happy because you're still doing it your way. Wow. And that's why you're not happy. Your relationships aren't happy. There's no contentment. You're going, I mean, it just feels like you're losing your mind. And this is the only reason. You're still doing it your way. Right. What I've learned about happiness that you could, what I've learned about happiness is that you could learn how to be happy. Right. See, happiness can be learned, happiness can be practiced, and happiness can become a habit. Happiness can be learned, happiness can be practiced, and happiness can become a habit, which becomes a lifestyle. Yeah. It can be that. Jesus lived this life. But look at Luke 11, 28. Read that for me, Christian. This is what the verse says. But he said, 
Happy rather are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Wow. So the scripture is saying the ones that put God's word, hear God's word and practice it, they're the ones who are happy. See, knowing the word doesn't make you happy. Wow. It's knowing the word and doing the word makes you happy. So the enemy knows I could rip you off of your joy, of your peace, if I just get you to just be a half-hearted Christian. Wow. What's a half-hearted Christian? One that hears it, that knows it, but never practices wow. it. And whatever you practice becomes a habit. And have you ever had a bad habit, Christian? Oh, yeah. I remember I had a bad habit of, uh, and I've shared this before, but I had a bad habit of spitting. <laughs> and I remember in, in high school, uh, no, it wasn't in high school, it was in junior high. And everybody, like, would spit, like it was a cool thing to do. <laughs> so I go, I want to be cool. So I just started spitting. I'd be spitting all over the place. And my mom says, where'd you get that habit from? I go, what habit? I don't have no habit. She goes, I know, but you're spitting all over the place. I go, Ma, that's not a habit. I just do it. I can stop anytime I want. And I remember we were in the kitchen having that conversation, and I spit right in the kitchen. <laughs> like I was out of control. That was a bad habit. Like I, it was a bad habit. I wasn't even thinking about it. But this, God has created us to be creatures of habit. Right. And that means if you develop bad habits, I love this. And if you develop bad mindsets, I love this. You could develop good habits, and good mindsets. That's right. But you got to practice them. Someone say practice. Practice. Hear it and do it over and over and over. Don't let sin train you. Let God's word train you. To start living this content, full, content life, this calm life, this sense of well-being life, it's available to every single one of us. Amen. And we can learn this. So we're hearing the word of God so we can learn how to get there. Yes. I want to get there. That's why people have coaches, and that's why people go to see therapists. They're saying something's wrong. Can you help me fix it? Because I know I'm not happy. I'm depressed. My relationships are right. Can you please help me get there where I want to be? There's not a person that's listening or is here that doesn't want a deep sense of well-being. There's not a person here that doesn't want to have a good night's sleep. There's no one here that doesn't want to have some peace and joy in their lives. And I have some good news for you. It can happen. You can have it. And it's found in Jesus and his teachings. That's right. So there's, now that we have those foundational truths, we know that they're, from the scripture, there are eight attitudes or mindsets that we can practice or learn that lead to a happy life. Now, we've covered two of them, but we want to review them tonight to make sure Just that real we... Quick, yeah. Really quick. So the first attitude is this, dependence. And this is saying this, I need God. What does that mean, Pastor? Well, it means this. I need God to have the joy of God, to have the life of God. What I'm saying is, I can't do it on my own. I can't fix me. My, I, I can't take out the depression. I can't set myself free. I need God to give me his joy, to save me, to set me free, right. and make me whole. I need God. Right. That's the first step. It says in Matthew 5, 3, Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And I like in another version in the NLT, it says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Yes. How awesome is that? And then attitude number two, which we covered last week, is repentance. And this is saying this, I am done doing it my way. What does that mean, Pastor? I'm done living a temporary, I'm done going to, to temporary things that give me temporary happiness that lead to long-term misery. I'm done doing it my way. Right. I'm done with the lust. I'm done I'm done with the unforgiveness. I, I'm, I'm just done. I'm done with those sites that I go to. I am, I am done with the party scene. All those things have made me empty, left my relationships destroyed, and left me in a state of deep despair. I am done doing it my way. And this is the idea. Until we're done doing it our way, you can, we can never have God's 
peace, wow. God's joy, God's happiness. This is the question. Are you done trying to make yourself happy? Are you finally ready? Are you done going to the world to make you happy? Are you done going to the weed to make you happy? Are you done going to your boyfriend to make you happy? Which boyfriend has really made you happy? <laughs> because the reality is it starts off happy, but somehow it just all falls apart. Be why does it fall apart? Because you're getting to know someone that deep down, they're not happy and they're not content and there's something missing and you're asking them to make you happy. So we got to get to the point. I need you, God. And number two, I'm done doing it my way and I repent of it. I want to now start doing it your way. That's the second attitude. Right, the second attitude. And Jesus says that in verse 4, he says, Happy are those who mourn, and God will comfort them. When he's talking about mourn, it's really talking about repentance. Right. But now this leads to the third attitude we're going to cover tonight, which is humility. This is saying this. Attitude number three, humility. This is, this is saying, I trust God and am grateful for what he has done for me. Uh, Matthew 5, 5 says this. Happy are those who are humble. They will receive what God has promised. Right. In, an, in another version, it says, amplified, it says, blessed or happy um, or blithesome, joyous, spiritually prosperous, with life, with joy, with satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions, are the meek or the mild, the patient, the long-suffering, for they shall inherit the earth. Pastor, can you share with us about what that means? What does humility mean? Well, let's look at what humil humility looks like. Because when we think about humble, um, I, I think we have all kinds of imaginations of what yeah. that might mean. Right. But um, this is a really precise word when we're talking about being humble. And w it, there's another word that's used, and it's the word meek that you just mentioned. Meek and, and being humble. And, I, and what, this, what it looks like is I'm going to give you three examples of what humility looks like and how you're going to see how it leads to happiness. The first, it looks like this. Number one, a total trust in the sovereignty of God in every circumstance. Now, this is, this is really what sovereignty, I was thinking, should I use that big word? And, and of course I should use the word. And, <laughs> and this is what sovereignty means, is that I trust that God is in charge and I don't question him. Wow. You'll never be happy with pride. The other thing that, that uh, being humble doesn't do, being humble does not blame God wow. when things don't go right. It doesn't question God when things don't go right. Being humble trusts God and knows this. I accept what's happening. You're in charge. You're in control. It might not be what I want, but I know this. You are going to work it all out for good. Right. You are in charge. I don't doubt you. I trust you. Now, when you have that kind of humble trust in the Lord, that he's sovereign, he's in charge, he's going to work it out. This is what happens. It makes you stable. Wow. It's possible to be stable. So this is what it's saying. Outside circumstances cannot mess you up wow. emotionally. Wow. So if circumstances, something happened to you and you lost your joy, you lost your peace. This is, I, this is what I do know. You do not have Macarios. Wow. And the other thing is you're not practicing humility. Mm. And it's, it's, a trust, it's a trust in God. Yeah. I trust you. You are in charge of my life. When things are going good and things are going bad, you are still in charge. Does anybody have that kind of faith? Come on. And if not, let's get it. Because when you get that kind of faith, you are dangerous to the devil. Because circumstances no longer mess you up. That's good. You can't lose something on the outside and mess you up on the inside. Right. You guys understand that? It, so, but when you don't have that, this, we're talking about humility, right. a trust in God, yeah. no matter what the circumstances is, we, we don't, this is what happens. We, again, are under, I would say, we're victims to our circumstance. Wow. 
And, and this is what God has been able to do at times in my life when I've gone through tough, tough times. He's able to give me strength, strength as I've trust him, trusted him. I remember my daughter had cancer. I remember that night the Holy Spirit came in as I depended on him, as I leaned on him. And he gave me a strength to go through that season of my life. I remember one time the doctor said, your daughter is going to be born with Down syndrome. And I remember there was a sense of calmness. It wasn't, I was not freaking out. I, I just said, okay, God, if I, I have a daughter that's Down syndrome, I don't know what you're going to do. You're sovereign. You're in charge. You do what you want to do. I'll love the baby. And maybe we'll start a ministry for Down syndrome children and, and their families. We'll turn this into something that glorifies you. But there's one thing for sure. I'm not going to stop. Uh, I'm not going to stop trusting you just because things aren't going good. Just because I feel sick. Just because I got a bad report. Because I will not bow to the enemy under pressure. Because I don't trust. I don't put my faith in what I see. I walk by faith. I don't walk by sight. I don't walk by my emotions. I don't walk by what I see. My bank account might not be there, but my, but you God, supply all of my needs according to your riches and glory. I might have got fired from my job. One closed door. You're opening a better door. I'm excited about what you're ready to do in my life. Give God some praise. Let's get some humility in our lives. Trust in God. That is so powerful. And and the scripture says, in Jeremiah 17, 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. It was trust in, I'm sorry, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. Okay. This guy don't fear when heat comes. You know what he's saying is? When the heat is on, it don't change me. Wow. I'll tell you why it don't change me, because my trust is not in the weather. Come on. We got too many fair weather Christians. Well. <laughs> when things are nice, they're nice. Yep. When things are rough, they're rough. Yep. But he said, when the heat is on, it don't change me right. because my source yes. is not in the weather. It don't matter what the weather is. It doesn't change. It doesn't matter if I'm going through a storm. It doesn't change what my faith is. I'm still trusting in the Lord. I'm good. Yes. Then it goes on to say, it does not fear when he comes for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought for it does not cease to bear fruit. Wow. Isn't that powerful? So this person that trusts in God, he comes. He's fine. Yeah. Leaves don't wither. He's not dying out. He's not going back into the world, going back to drugs, going back to the old lifestyle, going back to old relationships. He's solid because his trust is in the Lord. See, when I, see I've learned this, that under pressure, we, we, we discover where our faith is. So under pressure, when you're getting pressure, do all kinds of images of going back to old lifestyle for relief start coming up? Or do, is that what happens? Is that, is that the pattern? Because it's happened to me. Yeah. Where I, I've got pressure and I find myself falling in a mindset or in a habit. Like, wait, where does it come from? And, and, and what happened was, is that it was testing my faith. Mm. It was showing me where I really was at. I had too much weight on, my, on the thing or on the result right. or on the person. Right. And my faith switched. Right. It, it, was, it shifted right. from God to these things. And when the things didn't work out or the person failed me or I didn't get the result that I wanted, I started going back to trying to make myself content again. And, and if, if that's happened to you, don't beat yourself up. Go back to attitude number two, repent. <laughs> yeah. For doing it your way. Right. And let's go back so next time things don't work out, you're still good and you're still bearing fruit. Mm. That means that the weather, the circumstance, the drought doesn't change your attitude or your character. You're still loving. You're still kind. You still have joy. You're still praising God because you trust God. I love that. So that's almost like where normally someone in this situation wouldn't bear a fruit of patience. If I'm under pressure, someone's coming against me. It doesn't matter what season I'm in. It doesn't matter if this is normally a time where I wouldn't bear fruit. I'm going to bear fruit 
that the Spirit gives me in this situation. Doesn't matter the season or the time, but that's true trust and humility in God. No matter what the season, no matter what time of the year it is, I'm going to bear and fruit. And all we're saying is, God, you know better than me. You got this. Yeah. That's being humble. Yeah. I'm dependent on you. I'm, though I walk through valleys of shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. That That's was right. humility. That's right. it, um, David wasn't saying, I got this. He was saying, you got this. That's right. That's We're right. good. See, and that's what God said. Do we, and that's why when the disciples went through the storm, he rebuked them. Wow. Like he said, where's your faith? Where's your trust in me? Wait a second. Your faith is not in me. Your faith is in the weather. Your faith is in your circumstance. Your faith is in your boat. And that Jesus was sleeping. <laughs> why could he sleep? And they're freaking out. Because there was a difference. He was walking. He was meek. And he was humble, and he was trusting in the Father. Amen. And he was showing us, you could get through storms like this. So what we're talking about, how does, me, how does humility look like? Is trust in God, no matter what the circumstances wow. are. I'm right. good. You got it, Lord. That's awesome. So what does being humble look like? Number one was a total trust in the sovereignty of God in every circumstance. Number two is this. What does being humble look like? No resentment or revenge when being mistreated by God. Others, Pastor, what, is that, what does that look like? Well, it, it's, it's something I wrote down here. Able, you're able to endure, endure injury from others without becoming resentful or bitter. Wow. We are especially being humble when it is in our power to cause injury and we choose not to. Wow. Uh, see, we're not humble when we're angry, bitter, and resentful. We are prideful. What the pride is what gets you angry. Right. Your focus on self is what gets you upset and bitter. I can't believe what you did to me. And this type of focus of self perseverance we're trying to preserve ourselves, protect ourselves, it's all about us, is, is really pride. Right. Uh, but when we're humble... This is what Jesus, this is what allowed Jesus to endure the cross. He was on the cross. I want you to understand, Jesus was humble. Yeah. Because if he wasn't humble, it was easy to become prideful. Right. Like you don't, like, pride talks like this. Like you don't know who you're messing with. Right. <laughs> like if I was on the cross, I'd be tempted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God I wasn't dying for you because you would be saved for sure. Because I got major issues. I would have called those angels. How many angels do we got? That's, that's, that, that's, that's humility. That's being humble. That's being meek. He had all the angels. He all needed to do was just call one. And they would have just destroyed everybody. But what's kept him on the cross? His humility. Right. His calmness. And it didn't overcome his mission. Right. See, and when, when you're not calm and, and you're resentful and you're bitter, I'm going to ask you a question. Who stole your joy who took your peace wow. who or when did you lose your happiness wow. because I've learned this you can't be bitter and happy at the same time choose <laughs> now if you want to be bitter and you want to hold on to grudges and you want to be resentful you could do that but remember this the person that hurts you is hurting you twice wow. hurting you now and hurting you forever if you don't watch it. Wow. So, we, so being humble is being able to take it and not react. Right. And not dish it back out. Of course you're really good at cussing people out before you got saved. <laughs> Have you ever had someone like say something and like you're like, oh no you did. And you're like, oh, you're like I'm a Christian. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. But be careful right. because now the pride's getting in the way. Right. You know, it was just the other day, uh, yesterday, no, day before yesterday, we're at, we're at, me and Lisa are, are, are in a store, and Lisa's wearing her mask, and I'm wearing my mask, but Lisa's mask is not a real good mask, <laughs> because it has, like, gaps in it, and uh, one of our daughters said, you know, it's not a real good mask, it's not even a real mask, <laughs> but it looks like one, right, it's, so, but the lady in the store says, she, as soon as Lisa walks in, she goes, that's not a real mask. That's a fake mask. It's not even real. It has holes in it. It doesn't work. Like, and she just kept on. 
And then she just got a mask from the back and here, put this on, right? And, and like me, because I need to work on humility. <laughs> like I want to like get back. Like get back was like, get out of the store. It's like, you lost a customer, we're out. <laughs> but Lisa wasn't even moved. She said, okay, thank you. And then, like, this lady, like, I'm, I'm, like, trying, like, get different stuff in the store. She has, like, a real bad attitude. Like, I'm trying to get different stuff. And she's mad that I'm looking through the clothes to give to Lisa. Actually, like, you're messing up the order of my, my store. And I could feel all the pressure and things she's saying. She's not saying nothing nice. And I'm, like, thinking, I want to really get back at her. <laughs> like, where's a note? Something I could just say to let her know, bad customer service. <laughs> But I was wondering, why are, you, why are you so frustrated? So then I'm walking out, I go, Lisa, that lady was like rude. Huh? She goes, yeah, it didn't bother me though. Wow. I go, why? Are you <laughs> meek? Are you humble? Are you? <laughs> but the, the difference between me and her is that I went into like, I want, like, you got to like, what? Right. And then she kept her happiness, kept her peace, enjoyed her day, tried on some clothes, and left with some new clothes. And I left with a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you understand that? Yeah. So the reason I'm saying this is that we, the reason this is a teaching, because we need to repent right. of that right. resentment, bitterness, and unforgiveness, and let it go, and our pride, so we can start exchanging it for the peace and the makarios and the sense of well-being within us Amen. through trusting in God Amen. and doing it his way. Yes. It says in Ephesians 4.31, yeah. never be bitter, angry, or mad. Never shout angrily or say things to hurt others. What? <laughs> never do anything evil. Wow. Never do anything evil. You know that word evil, what evil means? is It's just simple. Like, what does evil mean? It's just never, the word evil means to do harm. Never do harm to others. Whoa. Never be bitter. Wow. Be angry or mad. Never shout angrily or say things that hurt others. When... Never. never. And what he's saying is, since it's never, it can become a lifestyle. Wow. And he's saying, don't do this, because if you do this, you can't have love, you can't have peace, you can't have joy, you can't have a sense of well-being, and you'll never be happy. Right. Is it worth it? Let's learn how to just let stuff go. Who cares? Half the people you're mad at don't even know you and you barely know them, or you do know them, and they don't even care, and you're all upset. <laughs> right? So let's let it go, yeah, yeah. and let's go hold on to the peace of God, and what it's going to do is make us a better witness. Right. We'll be happier, and when we're happy, here's what's going to happen. We're going to be way more effective in what wow, we do. That's awesome. So we're asking the question again, what does being humble look like? First thing is a total trust in the sovereignty of God. Second is no resentment or revenge when being mistreated by others. Number three, third thing, what does hum being humble look like? Gentleness, gentleness. It says in Titus 3, 2, tell them not to speak evil of anyone, but to live in peace with others. They should be gentle and polite to everyone, everyone. What does gent being gentle look like, Pastor? What, is, what does that look like? The first, he said, he said, this is what he says. He says, do not speak evil of anyone, but live in peace with others. Uh. So, first of all, where does this attitude of humility begin? In your conversation. Um, usually, if we're speaking evil of others, it's a sense of insecurity that comes from, or pride. That you're looking to put people down to make yourself feel better. That's pride. Mm. Um, when you're humble, you're always looking, you're so good with who you are, you get your satisfaction not by talking about people in a wrong way and putting them down right. and lifting yourself up with your own mouth, putting people down with your mouth and then lifting, lifting yourself up, putting them down with your mouth and lifting yourself up with your mouth, bragging about how good you are compared to them. <laughs> um, so he goes, he goes, that's a problem. Right. 
because that's where the, the, the pride begins. And you can never be gentle with a mouth full of hurt and pain. Right. Okay, um, but it goes on to say, it says, um, it says, tell them to speak evil of, do not speak evil of anyone, but live in peace with others. Now being gentle um, has to do with also this word peace. Um, it means don't be quarreling with others. Mm. Don't be contentious. Abstaining from fighting, not argumentative, avoid strife and hostility. And what it's saying is, is stop fighting, stop arguing, stop making everything a fight. But the point is, the point, the principle of the principle of the matter, the (laughs) principle. And all of that for a principle that you forget. Just think about this. How many times have you argued about something and you forgot what you were arguing about? You missed the principle. The principle of it is don't argue. Don't quarrel. Don't be argumentative. Stop picking fights over nothing. Right? Right? Right. So it says don't do that. So let's go into gentleness. Gentleness means friendly. And, And I've learned this. If you're friendly, you're happy. It, how are you going to be friendly and unhappy? It just doesn't work. First of all, for you to be friendly, right. you have to be welcoming and you have to have the right attitude right. first. Right. But also means respectful, thoughtful, um, sympathetic, easy to get along with. If you're hard to get along with, you're not humble. Mm. You're demanding your way. You're difficult. As a matter of fact, you're not thoughtful. Right. Um, have you ever talked to someone and they just don't get it? Like, that's hard. Like, like, you're not getting it. And you know why they don't get it? They're not listening to what you're saying. They're thinking about what they're going to say. That's not being humble. It's not being gentle. Let's keep on going. Um, it goes on to get along with or, or manage. If you're, e- if you're easy to get along with and easily to be managed, you are humble. You are, you're going to be happy. Things are going to work out for you. If you're hard to get along with and hard to be managed, it's going to be difficult for you. You're going to be unhappy. And you're probably going to be complaining about every place you're at and everyone you're doing business with because you're thinking it's them, but sometimes it's just you. Being gentle also means not to be harsh or rough or sharp or cold. That's really important too yeah. in our lives. Is yeah. A lot of times we aren't mindful about the words we're speaking and we're not careful. We're not being sensitive to where people are. So we have no regard. We'll just say a word. We'll just say something and we don't care about how people are going to take it, how they feel. So we come off harsh or cold or, or sharp. Well, this is what happens. When we're harsh, it's harsh, rough, and sharp. This is what it says about you. You're only thinking about what you're communicating. You're not thinking about the person. Right. And when you're harsh, rude, and rough, this this, this issue, you're so unaware, you're blinded by by the hurt that you're causing. Mm. When you're harsh, you're rude, and you and we're sharp. This is what, what this is what what's happening. You're hurting them but you're thinking you're getting something done. Wow. Because I'm getting something done. I'm making a point. But you're making also another point that you're, you're a person that hurts people, that you're not respectful, that you're not honorable. And this messes up with your own happiness. Right. Because there's no way you could be rough, hard, rude, sharp, and be happy. Right. Those two don't mix. Right. So we have to like, what we have to do, because we have to be careful and not say that, well, that's just the way I am. I tell the truth and if they don't like it, that's tough luck on them. They need to like grow up. They need to be, they just, they wear their feelings on their shoulder. No, hold on. <laughs> you're justifying, you're justifying the pride. Wow. You're justifying the harshness. You're born again and you get the fruit of the spirit so you could start, we could start living a life that's controlled and the Holy Spirit by the spirit of God and we're producing, or the Holy Spirit's producing the fruit of the spirit. That's why we need to be born again, not to remain the way we were. 
How many know that we need to become more alert and aware of this? Like, okay, because if I'm alert of this, I guess it's going to start, start changing my conversations. Really, right after this, say, wait a minute, am I harsh? This is not humility. And I understand this. If, you're, if, if this is happening, happening, you're harsh, you're rude, um, you're sharp, you're cold. This is what's going to happen. You're never going to be happy. So now, so we, we're, that's what it looks like. What does being humble look like? I'm trusting in God. I'm not being resentful or, or revengeful when I'm being mistreated and I'm walking in that gentleness. Right. So m- maybe the last question I would ask you, Pastor, is this, where does that begin? If, if someone's watching right now, they're saying, how do I start walking in true humility? Where does humility begin? And we're going to, this is driving it back, driving it home. Where do I get started with this? Number one, it begins when we give our lives to Jesus. It begins the day that we submit and surrender to the lordship and leadership of Jesus in our lives. Read Matthew 28, 30. 11, 28, it says this. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Are you weary carrying a heavy burden? This is Jesus talking. He says, come to me. Right. I will refresh your life for I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways, and you'll discover that I'm gentle, humble, easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. Wow, that's so cool. He said, are you not happy? You, are you tired of doing it your way? Just come to me. Right. And, and then I'm going to give you rest for your soul. Right. I'm going to give you that sense of well-being. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make life easier for you because the life you've been living, it's so hard. Trying to make yourself happy, being angry, isn't that hard? Being addicted to a bad habit, isn't that hard? Fighting all the time with everybody, isn't that hard? Aren't you tired of doing it that way? There is an alternative. Come to me and let me show you my ways. They're humble and they're gentle. And this will lead to it will lead to rest for yes. your soul. You know what he's saying? Stop doing it the hard way. There's a way easier way to do it, and it's my way. So, you know, when we do it God's way, he says forgive. That's way easier once you forgive. Life is easy. You don't have a whole bunch of enemies everywhere you go. You're not trying to dodge people everywhere you go. You're not trying to dodge it, 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 your emotions. Every time you see them, you're all angry. They take control of your emotions and your attitudes and what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. It's all over. You could go to every wedding. That's easier. <laughs> you could go to, yeah, I mean, you could go to any store. You could drive through any neighborhood. Because when you hate people, like, they control you so much. Like, don't drive in that neighborhood. They might be there. They control, you go to bed, you have nightmares about them. They show up, ah, <laughs> right? So it's easier, all right? And, and what's the second thing uh, where true humility begins? And we'll end it with this. It begins at the point where we were forgiven of our sins. Mm. We will never be practice humility until we remember what we've been forgiven of. Right. Because to be humble, you have to not hold on to resentment, bitterness. And you know what you have to give? Mercy, forgiveness, and grace. You don't give them what they deserve. You give them what you received. Wow. You don't give them what you deserve. What they deserve. You give them what you received. So freely you receive forgiveness. You receive mercy. And it's, I think it's really good to, yes, be forgiven of your sins. But I don't think it's always so good. I don't think you should be shameful of what you've done. Because you should have no condemnation for what you've done. But I think you should be aware of what you've been forgiven of. That's good. Because when you're aware of what you've been forgiven of, it's going to give you the mercy and the love to be able to deal with the faults and difficulties and challenges of other people. Right. And remember, you know, I, I, who am I to judge them when God has forgiven me right. of so much? Right. So it's okay to remember the place, the lowest moment that you were in, the lustful things that you were part of. The thoughts that you, you actually indulged in. And I'm not talking about memorize that stuff. But don't forget what you've been forgiven of. Yeah. Because when you remember that, it keeps you humble. Yeah. And one of the things that helps me on the freeway when someone cuts me off well. is this. I cut people off. <laughs> I've done it before. <laughs> so when they cut me off, I go, hey, that's all right, buddy. I, we're, join the club. We all do that. So it gives me the mercy yeah. 
is to remember I'm not a perfect driver. Right. And no one here is a perfect driver. Right. But when you're judging people and flipping them off and angry and chasing after them, road rage, you forgot how right. bad a driver you are. Right. So this is what gives us, but look what it says in Ephesians 4.32. We'll end it with that. It's the last scripture to, uh, tonight. It says, Ephesians 4.32, be kind and loving to each other. Right. Forgive each other the same as God forgave you through Christ. Wow. So this is where humility begins. First, we come to Jesus. Are you not happy? Come to Jesus. Make him your source. Number two, receive forgiveness of your sins. Humble yourself. I realize, Lord, I'm a sinner. If my people call by my name, will humble themselves and pray. This is what God says. He'll forgive you. He'll heal you. He'll make you whole. And he's saying, come to me. Let me show you my ways. Are you done doing it your way? There has to be a time where we say, okay, God, I realize that I've been all over the place emotionally because circumstances, outside circumstances, are messing with my emotions. Things are messing, when people are messing with my emotions, and there's a reason, I've lost my focus on you. I forgot that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Of course, this would not be the thing I would have chose for me to go through. But I do trust you that you know exactly what you're doing. And I'll trust, trust you in the process instead of being mad at you, yeah. angry with you, or question you. And I definitely, I'm tired of blaming you. Mm. Because you are not my problem. You are my savior. You're my healer. You're my help. You're my strength. I need you, Lord. I never want to lose that. I need you. I'm dependent on you. And when you depend on God says, God, you know, God will do this. Good. Because... I am your God, and I am almighty, and I got great plans for your life, and they're for good and not evil. So number one, place your faith in Jesus. Make him the Lord of your life. Or maybe we need to repent as believers of focusing on other things, and we lost our joy somewhere. And I know maybe you had a major loss, but God says, I'm in control. And you know, some of us are, are facing some real deep pain because you lost a loved one that was a believer, and, and, and you're, you stopped doing ministry, you're no longer happy. You're no longer praising God. You, it's hard for you to get involved with other believers. You've lost your joy. And God says, trust in me. Don't you know that they're with me? Don't you know that one day you're going to be with me? Don't you know? I know you're grieving, but let me heal your grief. Let me comfort you. Let me strengthen you. Let me give you some joy and sense of well-being even while you're going through this because there's hope for you. Today's your day. And number two, why don't we just receive forgiveness? Yes. Let's go ahead and receive forgiveness and let's give it. No matter what you've done, we serve a God that says, just come. I'll make it easy. Come on. Yeah. Not hard. Just come. I, I got all the goods. I got all the help. I have all the forgiveness. I have all the love. And there's no sin that you've committed that I will not forgive. There's no situation that you're going through that I can't reorganize and restore and rescue you from. Trust in me. Today's your day. And if that's you out there and say, man, you know, realistically, this spoke to me. I'm not happy. I've not been trusting God. I'm not happy because I've been resentful, bitter. Today's your day to forgive that person. Right. Forgive them. Let them go and let yourself go. So you could be happy from this moment on. We're breaking the power of the devil over your life right now. Right. The devil trapped you with that person. And that's what the Bible says. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against people. We wrestle against spiritual forces out there that are trying to rip us off. So if you're saying, Pastor, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to join. I want to join. I want to join my life to his. I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'm ready to forgive that person that hurt me. I'm done. I want to be happy again. Or, man, I've not been trusting God. I've been trusting circumstance. I've been all over the map. I'm done. I'm done with that. I've been harsh. I'm done with that. I want to change. Repeat after me. Bow your heads, close your eyes at home, and let's pray together. A prayer away is going to change your life. The Spirit of God's there to do the miracle. He does what you can do. I need God. Here He is. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, forgive me, Lord, for doing it my way. Today, I repent of my sins. I am done going to the world going to things to make me happy. I'm going to you now. Today, I make you the Lord 
and Savior of my life. You're in charge. You're in charge. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit that will, uh, that will produce love, joy, peace, self-control, gentleness, goodness, all these attributes that I'm lacking, but they're in you. And I forgive everyone that has hurt me. I let go of the bitterness of the resentment. I let it all go. I am forgiven and I forgive others. I don't give them what they deserve. I give them what I've received. From this day forward, I receive your joy and your joy will be my strength. I'm saved. I'm born again and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it, we're going to all congratulate you in the home. Raise your hand. I just said that prayer and I meant it. Congratulations. Today you received a new life, a new beginning. So now let's practice what we've learned today. And let's learn how to live a happy, contentful life. So what we're going to do right now in the homes, what I want you to do is just have a moment of prayer, just a few minutes. And this is a time where we pray for one another. Your home is a house of prayer. Your home is a place where the presence of God is there. I know you're busy and I know you're doing a lot of things, but God's saying, just stop. I want to do something. Just stop. I want to do something. Let's ask each other, is there anything you need prayer for? And let's pray for one another. Let's lay hands on one another. If someone is sick, they said we we'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Someone's been tormented. Let's set them free by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Today's their day of liberation. Today's their day of freedom. Let's pray and make an avenue for the presence of God to invade your problem, to invade your home, to invade your circumstance. Don't be anxious, but pray. So let's sing this song together as the worship team comes. And let's pray while this song is being sung and then we'll dismiss together. It's good. We can continue praying at home, but I just want to let you know God loves you. Whatever you're praying about, you know, God says, come on, whatever you ask, believe in that you've received it, it will be yours. 
You know, today's the time to put our trust in the Lord more than ever. There's so many troubled times that we're living in. But this is what we're saying. We're not going to be moved because our trust is in the Lord. Of course, we're going to go through suffering and trials and tribulations and difficulties. But the Lord is with us and he will work it out, out for good, especially as we're praying today. So be filled with the Holy Spirit. Understand this. God is with you. And if God is with you and if God is for you, who can come against you? Let's continue loving each other, building each other, life, building each other up. And let's continue living the happy life or the Macario's life that God has for us. And let's practice being humble. Love you guys so much. God bless you guys. See you Sunday. We're going to have another great service. Love you guys.